to the August Podcast Evolved Book Club, your favorite book club podcast, part of the Rated M Gaming Network. I am your host, Krista, and with me today is Aaron. Hello. And Oren. Welcome, everybody. Your names are too similar. We're going to have to change that. Um, this month, we're talking about Primordium. Quick disclaimer, um, in the book club, we do go over everything, so spoilers and all. If you care about spoilers... Go read the book. If you don't care about spoilers, then I guess keep listening. Do we have a book for you? Do we have a book for you? So Primordium is the second book in the Forerunner trilogy. It was written by Greg Bear, published by Tor Books. You can get it print, ebook, audiobook, all that great stuff. It was released on 301-12. It's the 3rd of January. I put the date the correct way, Krista. Thank you. <laughs> it's a real book. 384 amazing pages. And should we just go right into it? Yeah, pretty much. We start off in a faraway land. Ba, 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 ba. Okay. This was a terrible idea to leave you in charge. Excuse me. Excuse I me, offered. I'm hosting here. Let the record show <laughs> that I offered. I regret not accepting your <laughs> offer now. All right, we start off in a ship and that has just obtained some kind of Forerunner AI. And the Forerunner AI is like... Hey guys, let me tell you my story. And then the story starts with, I fell on a halo, and there were people there. So we get to we get introduced to Chakas, who was in the first book just a little bit, but now it's only his point of view for this book. And he lands on the halo after being like attacked and stuff like that. So he lands on the halo, and all of these uh, humans are like, who the hell is this? And so Chakas is trying to actually get off the Halo. Right? You guys would say he's trying to get off or trying to figure out what's going on? He's, he's trying to find uh, Riser, I think. He's sh- and trying to get his bearing is kind of his pri- primary goal. And I guess getting off of it is kind of later or just like something in the back of his mind. But he kind of just wants to figure out where he is and find his buddy Riser. Yeah, I mean, at this point, humans basically don't know what the hell's going on. They're almost like, in this timeline, it's they're like cattle to the Forerunners. Yeah, they're, they're all like cavemen. They're just dumb sort of creatures. Yeah, and I mean, he just has no idea what's going on. And on top of that, he has this inner voice that kind of knows what's going on that once in a while like rises up and is like, hey, Here's tip number one. Here's your tool tip, your tutorial tip. He also despises him as well. He does not like being inside, inside of Chakas. He's sort of like, I'm, I'm better than you. I definitely was better than you. Oh, for the love of God, I'm trapped inside you. Why am I stuck here? You're an idiot. Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk about him later and who actually he turns out to be. But at this point, he's just trying to figure out what's going on. And so he meets all these humans. He meets two of them called Glamapar. Gamapar? Gamaplar. Gamalpar. 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 <laughs> That's the way they say it in the audiobook, anyway. Uh, and Venevra? Vene- Venevra. 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 I didn't really listen to the audiobook, so I don't get the pronunciation. It's the reason I got the f- the audiobooks was because there's so many names in the Forerunner trilogy that I it's it's impossible, unbelievably wrong. He meets up with these two, and they're like, Venevra actually has an inner voice in her, and she's like, "We should go this way," and so they head off going that way. Well, Venevra doesn't have an inner voice. She has a geos of some sort, right? The way they describe it is she has like a compass sense, but Gamalpar has another inner voice, the same as Chakas. Unfortunately, you never find out like what this inner voice is because Venevra thinks they're just both batshit crazy. <laughs> Every time they talk about it, she's like, what the hell, you guys? Yeah, I can't sort of blame her. Like They talk about it at the start, like he's her crazy grandfather and he was exiled from the village because people really didn't like that he was that crazy. She reveals like, over time that he would talk to himself a lot and it would be his inner voice and the inner voice taught her like words of ancient human and all this stuff and he seems like the most i think to outsiders he's like the most schizophrenic old man you've ever seen but he's actually one of the more intelligent ones out of all of them because these humans are just kind of letting these forerunners come and like i pick you to go to they call it the palace of pain and so most people just go there and never come back Gamalplar actually went there, but is like too, like has PTSD and like yeah can't talk about it at all. Because that's the they set up for the book that there was like human cities that the forerunners let them build on the halo when they moved them there. Everything was fine for a while, 
and then suddenly the the Palace of Pain stuff started and the Forerunners started to abduct the humans. So now they're like roughing it in the woods, but they're running out of food and water and all the essentials. And this is where Chaka sort of meets everyone. Yeah, and so they decide not to go, not to go to the, not to get captured by the Forerunners and they decide to go off on their own. Incidentally, they actually end up at the Palace of Pain. Well, at first they don't realize that they're avoiding it. In the beginning, they go there because Benevra thinks it's the safe place to go, I think. There's like a signal going out. You find out there's this signal going out to all of these humans with these um, compasses, I guess we're going to call them, to go to the Palace of Pain. So they end up going there. Gios. Yeah, these seem to be like a mild one where I I think they reveal later it's something the librarian implanted in the humans on the ring that in the event of an emergency, they could be drawn to a forerunner research station to keep them safe. But then we find out it's been corrupted by mendicant bias and the primordial, which was mentioned at the end of Cryptum. It wasn't mentioned at the end. He was called the captive. I mean, he was talked about. Yes, he was the he was the captive. He's the the captive slash primordial. He's the big bad. The big bad. So they end up at the Palace of Pain and they see all these like human cattle going towards it, and the medicant bias and the primordial are like floating above them, kind of like hurting them in a way into this into this Palace of Pain. So they're like fuck this, and they turn around and go go the other way. And I mean, the, the thing about this book is there's a lot of walking around, and they see forerunner structures, but as we said before, the humans aren't very smart, so they kind of describe things in a way that it's like, it looked like a big spider web or something like that, and it's like, what the hell are you talking about? So it's kind of hard to decipher what actually is happening sometimes, which is probably one of the points of the book, but it gets frustrating. It does leave some of the language a little hard to understand. I know like the first time I was reading it, you're sort of thinking, what is this? What is this? What does that mean? And you, you sort of figure it out, but... Sometimes it can take a while. Sometimes you have to read a passage a couple times over and you're like, that's what they're talking about. Because I would say that we know the Halos pretty well up to this point, just in just in our, as fans, we know the Halos pretty well and what, what happens on them and what the structures on them look like. Well, yeah, I suppose it's worth mentioning that they say at the start of this, I think it's early on they mention it, that this Halo isn't the same as the halos we know it's it's like 10 times bigger or yes, something like it's that this right colossal halo they describe it and then i think they actually mention at one point because the other thing to mention about this book is we periodically jump from the chagas flashbacks to the present day where this conversation's going on between like some only scientists and officers on this unnamed ship and they're talking about how this halo couldn't have existed there's no halo that size the guy's clearly corrupted yeah they think he's crazy so every so often it it bounces back out again you can it's 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 not like a it's not like a stephen king's it bounce back where you're like oh they're in that time after you get like halfway through the chapter it's like you know exactly when it's bouncing back. It's it's formatted in yeah, such a way you know comes, exactly. It comes up again almost as like... It's like a calm. Thing. They're like transcript entries, aren't they? Yeah, it looks like transcript entries. So you know exactly when it's bouncing back when you're reading it, which is extremely helpful. And it's even more helpful in the audiobook because it'll glitch back out again and you get the other voices. That's really cool. I highly recommend the audiobook. Audiobooks are great. <laughs> it it not only like helps you but like i don't know i pictured this as like in the beginning because it's it's i guess we can say a three three four three kind of recounting his tale and it's just it's literally like a like a story that uh that you like would get at like a library or something so like him recounting like chaka's recounting it to you like it just felt like okay i'm at this is story time and he's giving me the history of halo they have like little touches where he'll go to talk about something like he goes to talk about his life on earth before the events at the halo and then it bounces back to the present era where he's like i can see your eyes are glazing over you're not interested in this okay we'll move on and you're like no i wanted to hear about that another big thing about this as they're um as they're traveling along is that there's this planet or this moon they call it the wolf-faced orb it's like an orange tinge to it and it's like, the halo's slowly getting closer and closer. 
to it as they're going. Yeah, and you notice too as the book goes on because um, Chakas's spirit is revealed. His name is Forchan- or Forchanthio. Forchanthio, yeah. The Lord of Admirals, which I'll call him from now on because that's much easier to say. But slowly over the book, he starts to educate Chakas on stuff. He starts to figure out that as the sun seems to be moving in the sky, it's actually the halo wobbling because it's slowing down as it's going into orbit around this planet. And then he's the whole way through the book, he's monitoring the size of the planet with his thumb. So he says in the book, 15 thumbs across, yeah. And the, he slowly works out that the the halo seems to be on a collision course for this planet. But we'll get into that a little later. So they leave the Palace of Pain, um, they kind of waddle on. And I mean, in between, in between like these major events going on, they're just like talking and sometimes the Lord of Emeralds will say something interesting, but it's mostly like those three talking to each other. Yeah. It, it, the interesting part is learning all about like the different places on the halo and stuff like that but other than that it gets a little like okay come on go and do something please i found these berries and they were yummy we were hungry the the stories of the ancient humans as they talk to each other aren't always that interesting not really these ancient humans don't have much going on honestly it's it's like cavemen over here sort of listening to cavemen talk to each other yeah um but they end up at this um village over a lake there are all these dead forerunners around it that seem infected and they one thing leads to another and in the middle of the village they actually find like a pre-grave mind like the keys grave mind that's just like a lump of tons of bodies trying to converge and form something yeah it's locked in like a cage in the middle of this like village hall so obviously the flood have broken out and they're only basically targeting forerunners well i i I don't think at this stage we know who they're targeting they don't say i think that comes a little later but they just seem to be infecting people but you would you would have to assume that if the flood were going to take over the they would have taken it over by now because there are no forerunners left on the ring yeah and when we see the like i think he's the proto grave mine but they because chakas and that and gamelpar don't know what the f- the flood is they don't really have much of a clue and it's up to um the lord of admirals to tell him this this thing they call the shaping sickness yeah and he's basically just like yeah we shouldn't be here we should probably yeah, get out of here this is some bad shit let's leave that's not somewhere we need to hang out so i mean that's kind of that's kind of the first part of the book i mean it only gets interesting towards the end so after this they kind of go off and they find this village that seems to have all these friendly humans with it and one like for some reason, they highlight this one huge gorilla, and it just kind of follows them around for the duration of the book. Yeah, is this colossal, like, great ape that, I think from the way they describe him, like, it must be three or four times the size of a normal human. Yeah, and her name is Mara, and they can actually, like, Venevra can actually talk to it a little bit. Yeah, I think she says you, you kind of have to listen to its chest and how it breathes, because it doesn't really talk in words. You can listen to its grunt. It turns out it's uh, highly intelligent. Actually, the ape seems to know more sometimes of what's going on than the humans do. Yeah. And so they end up in this village and everything seems fine. They finally get something really decent to eat. They go to bed. They meet, what do they call her? The life shaper or the life worker? Um, he is a life worker. Um, Genomander, folder of fortune. Yes, but let us just, we're just, for for the sake of our sanity, we're just going to call him the life worker. <laughs> yes. Or Genomander, sorry. So he seems really, really nice. So they go they go to bed and Chakas is woken up to Riser. Yes, who makes his first appearance. Yeah, so Riser makes his first appearance briefly. And then he goes away. And then um, Chakas decides that something weird's going on. So he goes and investigates and finds just no one in the village at all. He just can't find anyone. Uh, I think Riser tips him off uh, because he hasn't figured it out yet. But the gorilla has. Because it's Riser that says... The gorilla's smarter than you are because she's worked out that no one here smells. And yeah. that's their big clue is that none of there's all these different like shaped humans helping the life worker or the but no one has a scent. And then Chakas goes off with Genomander and Genomander reveals to him that he was left instructions to find any humans that have geishas and human memories like Chakas. 
and to use a device called the Composer to store those memories and save them in the databanks. He's basically immortalizing them so they can keep the um, Gios and the old ones and also the people that they inhabited. And he ends up not even being a life worker, he's just a monitor, correct? No, I think they revealed that he was a life worker and he was stationed at that station and he composed himself and transferred his own consciousness into... A monitor, yeah. And then as, I think as they go on and reveal this, he tries to compose Gamal Power because he's in, in the middle of dying, and Gamal Power refuses. And then after Gamal Power dies, Genomender and the other like fake humans that are monitors all shut down because they run out of power. They run out of power, and Chakas doesn't want to be composed either, so they've kind of just... They've run out of power and they've run out of stuff to do. I mean, they're kind of, if there's no one to be composed, there's no reason for them to be awake. Yeah. So they all go to sleep and then um, Gamalpar dies, Riser meets up back up with them, and the three of them go off exploring again. And once it seems like they're about to die, they, have no, they haven't had water or food, they're all exhausted, they find this train and they get on it and they end up far below the halo's surface. Don't forget, we skip one little important bit, is in the middle of that journey when they're going there, Riser tells his story of what happened to him, which is kind of cool. He oh, talks yeah. about how he had the same thing as Chakas. He was on this ship in a stasis pod. They crashed, and there were three forerunners. Two of them were fine, and one of them was locked in his armor because he was their prisoner, because in the middle of this, there's a forerunner civil war going on. Between the Didax people and the Master Builder. Yeah, I think it's the builders and the life workers. So this uh, forerunner that's immobilized tells them that the human's important to protect him. He's worth a fortune. And they take him off with them and they cross this like expansive desert and Riser starts to describe these like great volcanoes in the distance, which if you've played like Halo Wars and stuff, you'll know they're like spore mountains. Yes. And they're these these colossal like mountains of flood matter that are ejecting spores out over the desert. I think the the forerunner's armor shuts down so that or tries to kill them, so they have to take their armor off, and then that leaves them that they get infected by the flood. Yeah, and then they um I think they they die, but Riser assumes he's going to die, but he wakes up in the morning and finds that the He's just covered in spores and hasn't been affected. And so he just kind of keeps going and basically just finds his way to Chaka. Yeah, he ends up at the same village and that's how they end up going in the direction they do for the train because they can't go back over the lake. They can't go the way Riser came because Riser's convinced that the flood would have eventually worked out how to infect him. So they go the other way and they run up to this like monorail thing. Yeah, and this is when the book actually gets interesting. So they get on the monorail, they end up in the um kind of it's 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 close to, close to the silent cartographer, right? Basically the control room of Halo or something similar they, to it. Yeah, they they end up I think it from like the description it must be mending and biases like server room or something. They describe this like green spider web that's on the floor and then this crystal city that hovers above it on legs that move around the spider's web. So it sounds like it's supposed to be where Mending and Bias stores his intelligence. Yeah. That when they're there they find out it's all they're all humans that came originally from Earth that had memories implanted in them because Venevra was born on the Halo, but the likes of Gamalpar and Riser and Chakas came from Ur de Tyrene. So they have these aces implanted in them, but they're actual memories. They all undergo some sort of like painful surgery that they try not to remember, and I think that's at the hands of the primordial it's the primordial and i mean medicine bias and the primordial are working together and what they want to do what you find out that they want to do is one they don't like the foreigners so they can convince the um inner voices of all these um all these humans to work with them and they actually are competent and also they want to save the halo because it's been like a destruct sequence has been initiated and it's just going to crash right into this moon and so as the book's going on this halo's falling apart so parts of it are being ejected into space huge chunks of the halo are just being thrown out and then the halo gets smaller and smaller i don't think it gets smaller yet but they're preparing for I think they talk about how there's like sections of Halo plate are being stacked up around the Halo because they describe it at one stage, check us and that, when they're on their journey, this massive big plate crosses the sky above them and then disappears over the side of the Halo. Yeah. 
it's like they're stacking up spare parts because they're going to try and fly the halo around the planet because it's that big in doing that the gravity's gonna like pull chunks out of it and pull it apart so they're trying to get extra things extra like support and stuff they're gonna have these other plates ready and then reassemble it on the far side if they make it through i suppose is it important to stop and mention should we go over the story that um the lord of admirals tells because about the like the last days of the ancient humans because that's kind of important isn't it to why they're going to do what the what Mendigan Bias is asking them to do. Sure, if you want to go over that real quick. Right, it's it, during, I think, before they get to the train, Riser's ancient human talks with Chakas's ancient human, and Riser's ancient human turns out to be, like, the ancient human version of Dr. Halsey. Basically. Yeah, Yaprim Yaprakushma, I think is her name. Let's just call her Yaprim. <laughs> She was the scientist that found the ancient one, the primordial, that was buried. It was in a sort of stasis. It was almost dead. And they took it back to the humans, like, main planet, Ch- Charum Hakor, which you remember from the first book. And they were the ones that put it in the time lock in the ground. And they were the ones that spoke to it in the beginning. And then it drove a load of them mad and they committed suicide. During the last days of... Uh, the battle against the forerunners humans were driven back to Jerum Hakor where they held up for I think like 20 or something years something crazy long like that as the didact slowly smashed away their defenses and then it talks about how at the very end they're like locked in it must be like the government bunker as the forerunners come in and kick ass with everyone and anyone and then stack them out and compose them Yes. Which actually, if you watch the terminals in Halo 4, they cover all of that because that's all part of the Didact's backstory. So they actually have that sort of stuff animated. Which is awesome. <laughs> because I think like when you look at that stuff too, I think like the Lord of Admirals, he's like this sort of, he has this Native American vibe off him of sort of like he does, yeah, big blo- burly awesomeness. <laughs> yes. So that's why they hate the humans or hit the forerunners because they were driven back to their last planet and then wiped out and then anyone that could survive was rounded up and composed oh and they were composed because the forerunners knew that humans had found a cure for the flood yes and so they wanted to find it later so they composed none of the humans would tell them what it was so they composed them in the hopes that someday they might need it again and i think that's where we end up now and that's why the likes of Forchantio and that are there to be extracted from the humans. Okay, that's us up to date. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so they, they go into this thing where they start to save the Halo. I mean, everybody's basically hooked up to the machines so they can all think simultaneously and work work different parts of the Halo. And what they decide to do is, from what I understand, they decided to pass the Halo right... They pass the, pl- pass the moon right through the halo, right? Yeah, they pass, they pass the planet through the halo. The plan is that they'll glide over the planet, replace the plates that are damaged, and make it out the far side, and then repair the halo. Don't forget as well, when they're merged like with the halo systems, they're also merged or like linked mentally with partially composed forerunners. Yeah, who are... They're kind of, they're kind of floody too, right? Yeah, they're... They're part. Oh, that's they're partially composed, or the composer has been used to try and slow down the flood, the flood infection. But they talk about how like there are two, maybe three, four, forerunner bodies merged together, and then they have like forerunner armor coiled around them that's trying to stop them from finishing. So these forerunners are in. They're basically being used for their intelligence to help them. Um, to help get the halo moving they're in like tortured agony because they still know what's going on but they can't do anything about it and yada 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 float or bad <laughs> so that's the plan is they all link together and they're all going to direct the halo through because mendigant bias doesn't have the power anymore and the halo doesn't have the capability to do it itself yeah so he asks help from all these humans from air to tyrene and also something about the halo is that there are actually hard light spokes in the middle of the ha- of the halo like a wheel so they're worried about what's going to... They don't actually know what the hell is going to happen when they pass that through the planet. Yeah, that's the thing. You know, when they charge up... Is it in Halo? It is in Halo 2 when the Halo charges up and it sends out the beams of light into the middle. Yeah. And I think... I assume that's the same thing, just on a bigger scale, because it's a little hard sometimes to picture what they're talking about. But I think, wasn't that their plan then? They were going to hit the planet, or the planet was going to slide through the Halo... 
but on its way through it would hit and the, the hard light. light the hard light was gonna like stretch or something yeah, like kind that. of like a bungee elastic to slow them down or something and then they could get out the far side without too much force a lot of it's very hard to picture in your head it's very hard to picture and also like i said the humans don't actually know what's going on very much so the way they just they don't really understand what's going on so they're depicting they're trying to explain something to us that they don't fully understand themselves. And then at this stage as well, Chakas is tied into the halo, so he's gone kind of like euphorically crazy at the same time. Yeah, he's feeling what it feels like to not have a body and or emotions or pain for the first time. Yeah, so before they actually get to do their plan, the didact turns up. The didact turns up and like helps it. They, they end up getting it through and then the didact is like, Chakas, you're broken. The Didact comes up with like a new plan. He shows up with like a fleet of dreadnoughts and they wipe out. He shuts down Mendigant Bias with a special code word because if you're going back to the first book, Mendigant Bias was built by the Didact and the Master Builder. Yeah. Mendigant Bias became corrupted when the Master Builder left him on Installation 07 interrogating the Primordial for like 50 years. I think it was 42 yeah, and then he falls victim to the logic plague. Yeah, he comes... Yeah, that all that happens. Yes, that's the stuff from the terminals in Halo 3, if you're going back over that. Yeah, so that's that's already happened. And so, obviously, Medic and Bias is part of the Flood right now. And so, the, these dreadnoughts... These dreadnoughts offer, like, slip space. They're slip space drives, and they offer, like, power to the Halo to get it through the planet. Does it? go through the planet or the planet they... goes through the halo right see there this is the, the parts where i start to get like iffy it honest honestly honestly the bottom line is they get it through the planet something happens it's if, if you've read it yourself you understand that it's very like a gray area of what actually happened that's a, the thing because the didact's plan was to make a slip space bubble and take the halo to the ark but they needed to make the halo smaller so i'm not sure if the halo I went around was, the I planet. Think it was, I think it got through the planet. And then they shrank it. Yeah, they decided to make the halo smaller. And so what they did was they started ejecting parts of the halo into space. And so the halo got smaller and smaller and smaller. And then it becomes the size of one of our halos. And then it becomes installation 07, basically. Which is, if you ever go back and play Halo 3, there's one halo in the... Like it's the, the most mysterious room. halo. Yeah, it's the one with like fog over the surface and you can't see anything in it. And didn't they add that as like like almost a burial site for the battle that happened there? Well, they talk about how... Um, also, its systems are like broken. Yeah, I think it still works as a halo, but they don't mention much else. But I think Guilty Spark at some point says there's no way to know if anything's still alive or not on the surface of that halo guilty spark almost like fantasizes that there might still be like humans and intelligent life on it under the clouds or just like the flood and the protograve mines yeah but you would think if the flood and the protograve mines were still on there they would be finding a way to get off of it with all that technology i got the impression everything that's on that halo is kind of in stasis okay you know, it's just sort of locked down in the fog and it's not really doing anything yeah it's it's almost like frozen in time after all that happened at that battle I mean, the Halo did its job, it fired when it needed to fire, and now it's just kind of sitting there. They go through all that, and then we join... It's a monument to all your sins. <laughs> I think that could be one of the monuments. And then we join Chakas again with the Didact, who, which, by the way, this is the first time they properly reveal that Born Stellar turned into the Didact, because they hint at it at the end of Cryptum, but this is the first time where they refer to him as, you know, he is the new Didact. He is Born Stellar. The other Didact, which is the Halo 4 Didact, is missing. Yes. At this point, no one knows what happened, so Born Stellar sort of steps up as the Didact Mark II, or the ISO Didact. He briefly talks about his relationship with the librarian. He's like, yeah, it's kind of weird. <laughs> yeah, it's just like... I'm like her Mark II husband. <laughs> but at this point, like, Born Stellar is not Born Stellar anymore. He's the Isodidact. Yeah, he's the Isodidact. And then at this point, Chakas is almost more machine than man. That He talks about how he can, like, if he looks down, he can kind of see a hand and stuff sticking out of some metalwork. But when he talks to the Didact, he's it's not tinny. using his... He's not using his mouth, I think, is the thing. He thinks yeah. the words and the didact answers him. And then um, he also says that he doesn't feel any pain. He's not feeling much at all. He only feels the emotion he cho chooses to feel. Apart from, like, he, ha I think he has, like, one panic attack. 
and then the didact resets him yeah like he, he turns him on and off again and then tells him to chill out or he'll break down again and he'll have to shut him down possibly permanently yeah and what what they explain what happened is when when the lord of admirals was extracted from chakos his body was basically just they did it so fast and so sloppily that it ruined ruined his vessel. Chakas was sort of broken and mortally wounded. So they put they were he's he's in the process of being transferred to his monitor state or three four three guilty spark. So, like you said earlier, file save as renamed three four three guilty spark. They go to great lengths never to mention his name till the very end of the book. Which is a nice touch in the audiobook that the audiobook's narrated by Tim Dadabo, but it's Tim Dadabo, isn't it? Yeah, it's Tim Dadabo that plays Guilty Spark. The whole way through the book, he has a, like a sort of normal human voice until the end as it reveals that Ch- Chakas is Guilty Spark, and then they add in the Guilty Spark sound effects as he switches over, but we're slightly ahead of ourselves with that. Yeah. Well, now, now that since we've already talked about it real quick. The thing that I think would have made this book a little easier to read the first time is if you already knew that Chakos was going to be Guilty Spark from the beginning. Because when you're just reading it for the first time, you're like, why should I care about this character? You're just kind of wondering. They keep dropping hints at it um, the whole way through the book, but they never, the UNSC staff are never willing to commit that it is Guilty Spark. They're all dubious about it so no one ever says the name out loud because they all refuse to believe I think that it there's yeah. a line in it at one stage where they say look if one of us says this we're staking our claim that we think this is true no one's willing to put their like reputation on the line through most of the book but i mean just just as an outsider reading in it would have been nice to know that at the first because the second time i read through the book it's a lot more palatable because you know who chakos is going to be and you have an interest in the character because when you don't know that, you're like, why should I care about this person? Did you did you ever feel that? I suppose kind of, but then at, I'm at this stage now where like, it's been a, f- a few years and I've since reread that book. Yeah. Well, I've reread it multiple times since then, so I know now. I, I can't really remember what it was like the first time I read it. Yeah. When I didn't know. I, I do remember being like reading through it going like, is it? Is it him? Is it really him? No, they, they, they're they like not hinting at it. And then when they reveal it at the end, you're like, oh, it is. It really is him. Yeah. Like, I remember that being like a bit of a big thing, even though they hint at it the whole way through the book. When they actually confirm it at the end, it's still a big deal. Honestly, if you have this book, don't ever accidentally turn to the last page because it says in big bold letters, 343 three, Guilty Spark. <laughs> Although then again, if you've listened to this, you're doomed anyway. You're doomed anyway, but we gave you a disclaimer at the beginning, so it's all your fault anyway. And I think then we go back to the flashback because we jumped a little ahead. Chagas and the Didact go to confront the primordial, primordial that they've captured. They reveal that the Didact, I think when they first meet him, prim- one of the primordial's arms fall off and Chakas is trying to figure out what's going on. Well, his arms fall off and it just becomes dust. Well, no, before that, like when he's standing there, he like one of his arms snaps off and Chakas can sense that something isn't quite right. And then the didact starts to interrogate him and they have this back and forth where through this, the primordial reveals that he is the grave mind. And that he is multiple primordials. He is the he is the first grave mind and that other precursors might exist or, or might still exist. And he also reveals that yeah, the precursors in the flood are one and the same. Yeah, and also this is when the didact kind of figures out that the flood can choose whether to infect someone or not. Yes, the and that was the immunity that humans had. He reveals that there were, there never was immunity that the flood chose or that they chose not to infect humanity because they believed humanity were the rightful heirs to the mantle, which changes obviously. <laughs> he he re- finds all this out and then he also i think the penny drops with the didact that even the whole time that the precursor was locked in the time lock by the ancient humans he was still controlling the flood because yeah. i think it's revealed that he was the one or the the insinuation i take away from it is that he was the reason the ships flew into the galaxy in the first place like the the precursor himself set all these things in motion and then the precursor says to the didact that kill this form and another one can activate. Yeah. Which links well, back to the thing we know about the flood that there's always... Well, what always... happened is it says, um, 
It is your task to kill this servant, it said, that another may be free. Yeah, so any of those protograve minds about the place will activate. And then I, ass- I assume there's a few of them, but they're, pro- they're after this. The, the precursor is a very particular form. They describe them as like a tall... There are pictures people have drawn that are quite good. You can Google them to see and get a he mental image. He looks like a weird, like, fat centipede thing. <laughs> He's like a centipede with a scorpion-like head with a tail attached to it and multiple eyes and arms. They figure out that he's multiple precursors merged together to form the primordial. Every, I assume after that, every grave mine just looks like the Halo 2 tentacle monster. Yeah. I mean, I suppose the grave mind could choose what form it wanted to be, and that grave mind just chose to form like that. Although then again, he is, it's always, that's the other thing then, it is always the same consciousness going forward. The same consciousness that speaks to you in Halo 2 and Halo 3 is the same is as the this same, one. Yes, he's the same guy that spoke to the didact all those years ago. It's And it's really easy to imagine the voice because it... In this in this part of the book, he's still talking in the weird riddles that the grave mind talks. And like when when he's explaining the flood, he says, "We are the flood. There is no different difference until all space and time are rolled up, and life is crushed in in the folds. No end to war, grief, or pain. In a hundred and one thousand centuries, da 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 da. Unity again and wisdom. Until then, sweetness. And it's like you you have to reread the chapter a couple times to actually understand what the hell's he's trying to say which has always been a big i've always loved the grave mind for that because he speaks in stuff that can allude to so many other things and it's fun to figure it out and like the thing i take away from it is the he sort of says to the didact we're playing the long game here and we're willing to wait the centuries and millennia but eventually we're going to succeed yeah and the forerunners kind of do the job for him (laughs) Yeah, and he also reveals this thing about how humans will next to be tested and the flood is the test for yes. assuming the mantle, which hints at whole loads of things. They say that the forerunners failed their test, which I assume is they failed to find a way to stop the flood. I know technically, well, no, they didn't stop the flood because the Halos only slowed it down. Yeah, and also, I mean, if, we, if we're, if we're going to go into the games and stuff with this, humanity hasn't actually found a way to slow the, to stop the flood either. They just used the Forerunner stuff, stuff to do it. So you would think the Forerunner stuff doesn't technically count, which again alludes to the thing that the flood will come back to test humanity again, kind of Yeah, thing. so expect the flood to come back that's going to be a thing and then the didact finally has enough and he kind of pulls the switch yeah he activates this control and that's when it's revealed that the thing shaka or chakas could sense was the equivalent of like a reverse stasis field and suddenly time starts to speed up for the primordial and he turns into dust yeah millions of years pass and he just slowly crumbles in front of their eyes although for a brief like moment the didact does hesitate when he says, you know, release this servant and another one will be will take its place. He does yeah. hesitate for a moment, but then he does it anyway. And he also he also says it's hard to kill a god. Yeah. That leads on back to where are we going from here? Uh they talk about three four they go back to three four three guilty spark, basic well, Chakas goes off to help the librarian and the didact, and that's kind of where we leave him off with. Kind of at the arc. He they're at the greater arc, right? The big one? Um I th- it's hard to tell, yeah. Are they the greater arc or the minor arc? Because this is a reveal, if you haven't, there are two arcs. There's one for the big halos and one for the little halos. Yes, there are two types of halos. They do different things. The little halos wipe out all life in the galaxy and the big halos wipe out life in like specific solar systems and planets. They can actually be like, well, and that's why Air to Tyrene kind of collapsed because they used a halo just on that planet to test it. Or uh, uh, Charum Hakor, because Air to Tyrene. Oh, Charum Hakor, excuse me. <laughs> Ancient names everywhere. I know. That's it. And then they reveal that I think it switches back to the present day then, and the Oni guys are having an argument about is this definitely 343 Guilty Spark? And they're starting to realize that he is the Guilty Spark that Master Chief blew up, the one that killed Johnson. And this is when, if you're listening to the audiobook, the slowly they start to layer on the sound effects and Tim Dadao becomes Guilty Spark. Oh, that's and so this cool. is when it's re- they reveal that Chakas and a number of other 
human he personalities. Has, like, he has tons of human personalities in him that have been kind of composed into him. I assume the Lord of Admirals as well, because at one yes. point the Lord of Admirals in the present day talks through Guilty Spark. He takes over the system and talks to the Oni people. So basically, Guilty Spark is basically like ancient like a hive mind. ancient humanity. Yeah, a hive mind of ancient humanity. Um, I think Chakas is the, like, dominant form of it but they all merge together and slowly as he's been telling this story the other memories have started to awaken this is what i take away from it so as he tells the story while he's on the only ship he's rebooting and then he goes from being just chakas to being guilty spark the collective mind and then he takes it over the ship he t- yes he he, a couple of times throughout the story he breaks like the human firewalls and they have to reset the system again and tell him to behave but at the very end he shuts down the ship's ai and the life support yeah he takes full control of the ship and then as some of the engineers they never mention names but some of the only guys listen to a transmission at the bridge where the captain's talking to guilty spark and guilty spark tells the captain that over the the millennia as he was on the halo he studied and searched and he now believes he knows where the life shaper is. And also he mentions that on the ship there's probably Venevra and Riser's old spirits within he, one he of them. He believes that, yeah, they're in one of the humans, contains his old friends, and he knows where the life shaper is, and he's going to go to the life shaper and get her to bring his old friends back. And the, la- the last thing, the last thing of the book is just, I know where to find her, and that's the end. And he steals the ship. That is literally the end of this plot line as we know it right now. Yep. And actually, we do know more because we can go into this. I put some notes in, but I went over this a while ago in the group. All that's happening here is the prologue to Hunters in the Dark. Oh. Uh... This, this ship is the Rubicon. Oh. The ship in the start of Hunters in the Dark, when you read it, that sent the teams out onto the surface of the Ark. And all of them were killed except for Kodiak's brother. When the intelligence on the Ark talks to Kodiak's brother, he says, your ship has left, it's been kidnapped by another, or it's been usurped by another. That's this. Guilty Spark stole that ship. They they found him, they took him back. He steals the ship. And that also, there's a there was a thing years ago called the 11th Hour Reports on... That talks a little bit more about it. Yeah, yeah. That, there's there's a section on that too. If you're looking for it, it's called Provenance. It's uh, the fourth report. They were released on the site over the years, but there's transcripts everywhere. So they revealed that this was the Rubicon. This ship was sent out after... There was a signal detected from the Ark... So this ship was dispatched to go and check it, and this was after the events of Halo 3, and then that's where the first ship disappeared and went off on its long, wherever Guilty Spark took it. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the thing that really bugs me is that, if you think about it, Halo has so many plot lines like this where they just end, and you get little hints of what's going on, but they just haven't gotten back to them yet. Well, you see, remember back when we had the reveal of the Halo TV show? Yes. This when we talked about it at the time and I said I had this idea of what the plot could have been for the TV show I assumed the plot was going to be this I figured the TV show was going to be the crew of the Rubicon with Guilty Spark on the search for the life worker or the life shaper yeah and that was my idea for you could introduce the whole Halo universe on a TV show through flashbacks with Guilty Spark, him talking with the crew, kind of like if you ever watched that last Stargate show that they cancelled in like the second season, um, Stargate Universe. It's a very similar sort of idea. That show starts off in the middle of the action and slowly as the seasons roll on, they reveal the backstory and they reveal the details on characters and the rest of it. So you can watch the show having never seen an episode of the like 50 seasons of Stargate and you can slowly figure out everything that happened and what went on. That would be interesting. I thought it was like I thought it was a reasonably good idea because the forerunners have to come back at some point. There's hinted at that some of them exist. Yeah, and it would be very interesting to see cuz we've already seen the librarian once in Halo 4, so it wouldn't be out of the question for her to actually be alive and it's actually ah. been talked about so much. I want to point out without, I'll not mention anything specific because it points to a spoiler in another book, but he doesn't, the third book. Okay. 
But I will point out very specifically, Guilty Spark says he knows where the life shaper is, not the librarian. Oh, you that's There's true. There's yeah. a very important word there. You f- you'll understand the importance of it when you read Silentium, but it's very important to point that out because if you've read the terminals in Halo 3, the librarian died on Earth. Yeah, but the life shaper is still... There's there's a thing. There's a thing. There's a thing. There's and we'll a, talk a, about it. There's always a MacGuffin. We'll talk about it in when we talk about Silentium, but... What did, what did you guys think? It's, it's hard to think of this book by its... It's hard to think of any of the books in the Forerunner trilogy by themselves, but I definitely think this is kind of like the boring middle story in between the awesome beginning and the awesome end yeah i think this is like the weakest of the three now in saying that it's not a bad book like it's i think these are the best three books in halo personally and to be the weakest of the best books isn't exactly a bad thing like it's no it's no flood no it is no flood what do you think or like just from your time with it and yeah i mean i i think i'd kind of agree more so with you in the sense that i guess it has its weak elements but like i still very much enjoy reading it and it's it's i'm asking myself a lot like okay why is this important and it's not necessarily because of like oh i'm bored why is it important it's like okay this is in the book and they're bringing all these things together and this is a middle chapter in a trilogy so there's all these small little moments in like the first like third of like two thirds of the book like basically i've i've read up to or i guess or right before you meet minidic bias and the primordial and the didact when like when really like all these elements really like kick off and so all the moments like before that is just like little tastes of like things here and here and you learn more about the the different humans that are already there and then the monitors that are also there and then you meet this gorilla and you're like okay why is this gorilla here and you meet you see the grave mind and then they're like the character's first exposure with um the flood and all that and so it's just so yeah i i enjoy it it's it, i can see how it's not for everyone and it definitely, there were times where I was just kind of like, this is weird as a sense of it being Halo. Like, it's it's not, it's definitely not like a Halo. It's very hard sci-fi. Like, it's the... That's what Greg Bear writes, though. Yeah, like, he, he's very big. Like, this is space opera sci-fi, but, like, this is, this is sci-fi as sci-fi. Like, it's really way beyond what you normally get in Halo. And that's not usually... I never usually thought of myself as a fan of that sort of thing. Like, I enjoyed Halo more than some other really, like, big, grandiose space operas. But after reading these books, I think, like, I might go back and give some other things a try that I sort of dismissed before because I did kind of enjoy this. But the thing about this book, I think, is it's constantly setting up little things for Silentium. It is, There are so many little things, names, mentions, characters, events that just get fleshed out so much more in the third book. Like, it takes some things from... I think the biggest things it takes from Primordium, or from Cryptum to Primordium, is the precursor. That's, that is that is the big character, yeah. That's the big thing. I suppose him and Chakas are the two things. Like, if the first book is Born Stellar's story, this book is Chakas' story, and then they go into mostly, like, the, the precursor stuff. But then it lays so much for the third book which is another character story. I'll not mention that. Because again, like you said, it's so hard to talk about these books in a bubble. Had we talked about them maybe at the time in 2000 and, uh, 2012? Yeah. This probably would have been a lot. Like, I remember this book came out. This was the last book that came out just before Halo 4. Yeah. So I remember I read all this and then it was like, holy, this was the book that came out. Selentium didn't come out till after, did it? Yeah, so I think Selentium it came, came out, out like right Selentium after. Selentium came after, came out afterwards, but I, I don't, I don't know when Primordium and Cryptum did. That's the thing that confused me because I had read these books and then you start Halo Four and you're like, why is the Didact the bad guy? Actually, no. Yeah. This one, wait. This one came out in 2012, isn't that? Yeah, that's when um, Halo Four came out. Yeah, Han- Halo Four I came thought- out November 11th, 2012. Yeah, so that that was the thing that got me because. And that was my niggle about Halo 4's story was they didn't explain 
why the didact was the bad guy and this book didn't explain it because i sat at the time playing it being like like i've got two books under my belt i'm not quite sure they do kind of explain why i suppose they do explain sort of why the didact doesn't like humans in these books because the first book they talk about how the human forerunner war took a toll on him he lost all his children yeah but even at that stage when we leave the didact at the end of uh, cryptum he's still not the bad guy no he hasn't gone bad shit and there was so much at the time that just wasn't explained and we didn't get that until silentium and then it was like oh now it makes sense Overall, what do you think then? I, like I said, I think this is the... Worst of the best. <laughs> the worst of the best. This is number three in the list. And probably Primordium's number two and Silentium definitely... Or Cryptum's number two. And Silentium's, and Silentium's definitely the best. Yeah. I mean, I agree. I agree fully. I'd probably put this, um, I don't know, from my experience and reading it the first time. And, and, actually, and I guess this kind of goes back to Chris, the way you were saying, where... Like I knew that three four three guilty spark was Ch- or Chakas is three four three three guilty spark, and I I when I first read like the opening prologue like my mind like went there I'm like oh this is an AI monitor is it three four three and then like after I read like I don't know like five chapters or something I was like on R Halo or something and it got spoiled for me and I was just like oh okay well that makes a lot of sense and then just started reading it and. And I guess it gave some more validation to like, okay, I'm reading this to find out what happens to Chakas and how he becomes Guilty Spark. And then when he actually talks and finds all the other monitors and you actually see what they describe as the monitor with the blue eye and it's kind of like a little bit of foreshadowing again. So like that aspect was really was really interesting, but I, I think I'd hold this book, at least of what I've read, and it seems like it's just going to get better, about on par with uh, Cryptum. Okay. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure which one I would really prefer. I think Cryptum also has a kind of slow start, but then once it picks up, and I think it picks up a lot quicker in Cryptum. That's the thing for me. The slow start in Cryptum stops. I think once the Didact leaves the crater, once yeah. he gets his ship and starts the like Didact's tour of the galaxy. <laughs> once he goes yeah, on his like, road even, trip, even there, it's it's still kind of explaining history and stuff not to necessarily that like it's boring or anything but it's just like it's just slow it's very low it's very low energy is the thing like it's not you get things out of it and it's not bad but i kind of feel like when there's this massive big sort of intergalactic struggle going on i'm not overly bothered about what the tribes of humans on the halo are up to yeah True. and i know it's kind of showing us what's happening on the halo through their eyes but i just think until they reach the village and they reach genomender it's just they keep dropping little hints of things that fascinate me but a lot of it's just talking traveling talking traveling and if it wasn't for the Lord of Admirals stuff, like he's, I think, the most interesting thing in those early chapters. Definitely. His his insights and his contributions through the story definitely make it much more interesting. Yeah. Did we explain, or does it explain, like, how, like, the Lord of Admirals gets imprinted with within Chakos? Like, like how, and, like, same thing with Risers. They do explain it. They also explain it in the Halo 4 Terminals. The short version is... The librarian uses the composer to turn you, kind of in the same way that the didact used it to turn humans into Prometheans, you can also turn humans into AI. I think the what happens is you compose a human and you become essentially an AI, a program, but if you then turn that program back into a physical form, you accidentally create a Promethean instead of like a Cortana at the end of yeah. Halo 5. You know the way she looks like a person whereas the prometheans and the crawlers are all a bit fucked up that was the didact figuring out that you could turn humans back into a form but, but it just didn't go yes one. but it's just not a human so instead you just put it into another human yes so if you just compose a human you download them into a essentially you just download them onto the computer network and then the librarian used her own skills to seed those minds into the dna of humanity but only the humans that were on earth none of the others because none of the humans on the halo have these ancient human memories and actually the humans it's only from the ones on Erda Tyree. yes and the humans from earth were never meant to be on the halo 
because the Didact was terrified of the idea that someone like the Lord of Admirals would be on the Halo and would be able to take control of it because the Forerunners very nearly lost the war to humanity. They're the only enemy that ever pushed them that far apart from the Flood. So the idea that the Lord of Admirals would be on the Halo is the ultimate no-no as far as the Didact's concerned. But the Master Builder didn't give a fuck. So he took (laughs) humans from anywhere that he could because he wanted to find the cure for the or the immunity yeah and that's how they ended up there but that's how that's how the lord of admirals and others end up and the other thing is each human contains they, they hint at it that each human contains multiple if not all of these gases but different ones activate in different people so they talk about how i think the, the lord of admiral says that in the beginning he formed as like little sort of spurts of consciousness and the occasional thought And then he slowly came into being and he describes other voices around him that faded into the background. Yeah. So that he becomes the conscious person in that body in much the same way that in Riser's body he got a different person. Every ancient human on Earth, in theory, was capable of activating a different one. I guess it just depends with the environment you're in, how you think, what kind of person you are. Which was, like, after finishing this book and playing Halo 4, I was convinced that the Lord of Admirals was going to be in John's head in Halo 5. He has some kind of gios. He has something. She did something to him and put him on, like, the next step of evolution. And I kind of figured when Cortana died at the end, the next game would feature John. Because you need an AI of some sort or you need a voice because John's not exactly the most chatty character for conveying stuff. So I figured who better than the Lord of Admirals to be the one directing John? Two military minds trapped in the one body. That would have been interesting. You should be writing Halo. I could give it a go if Frank wants to call me. (laughs) Take Jeff's place. (gasps) No! No, we like Jeff too much. We do I, like I Jeff. I will work under Jeff. I will be his minion. You will fetch the coffee and the pizza. I will fetch the coffee and the pizza as long as he lets me write George back into Halo. <laughs> oh my gosh, you and George. Why don't you just marry him already? Oh wait, he's dead. <gasps> Ooh. Right, well, this one ran a bit long as a book club. Will we Will we finish it off then? Is there anything yeah. else really left to talk about? I mean, about? We, got, we got trivia and stuff. Oh, we do have some trivia. I put some in the bottom. Um, I'll run through this quick. Trivia, as taken from Helopedia. A primordium is an aggregation of cells that is the first stage in the development of an organ or tissue. In the context of the novel, it is the, the derivation of the term primordial, which is the title given to the last precursor. So like the, like the flood, basically. Uh, the novel's cover illustration, as well as cryptum and eventually silentium, were concept art for Halo 4 and were illustrated by Sparth. And he's Nicholas uh, Bouvier. They're all of all of the all of the art on those three books is fantastic. They are beautiful. The novel is dedicated to Claude Area, a longtime Bungie and Halo fan, and he was the founder of Halo.bungie.org. The audio version, as I said, is narrated by Tim Dadabo, the voice of Guilty Spark, and that's very deliberate. Like I said, the fourth eleventh hour report called Provenance provided the extra background details to the name of the ship and what happened and also as a hint if you have mythos that's where the date came from because until we got mythos we didn't have an exact date for when this all happened we just had rough ideas of years we knew it was somewhere between 2053 and 20 when did hunters in the dark take place like or 2558 or something isn't it yeah i think so Something around that. So we knew we had this window of like several years when this happened and then Hunters in the Dark narrowed it down and then we got Mythos that gave us the exact date of August. Yay for Mythos. Which I still don't have, thank you. <laughs> Stupid books. I have it. Oh, Aww. Are, but I haven't I haven't really checked it out yet because I'm trying to finish Primordium. Well, I recommend if you're still going at it, the audiobook, and I, like I said to anyone that's listening, it's worth a listen for all of them, even to hear the names of things pronounced. And it makes it slightly easier to get a mental image for what's happening as you listen to it. Yeah. The second book in particular, this one, for the performance by Tim Dadabo, because occasionally in his other characters you hear hints of guilty spark when he's talking sometimes like he just sometimes he can't seem to control it and he just lets it slip 
and it always seems to be foreshadowing the end of the book when he reveals himself to be the actual guilty spark and they do a good job with it yay <laughs> all right any any other uh comments questions I'm kind when, of uh, when are we gonna do Salentium? Do we have November or or December? Is it November? No, or December? I think we moved it up to November because we don't want to. We're gonna do a couple of little things in December just to keep over the Christmas break. Yeah, but we we moved Salentium up a little bit so we could get into it before Christmas because we're going to as well as it just being like a Salentium book club. It's going to be. The Forerunner Book Club. Yeah, where we just kind of talk about everything. We're going to have lots to talk about because that book drops major bombshells. Just just mind-boggling bombshells. Just like all over the place. So I suggest for the next book club we mark our pages just so we can look at those bombshells page by page. There will be many notes. There will be many notes. But if we are all done, if you want to know what the next book club is going to be, there is a group on the on our Facebook, so just look up Podcast Evolved Book Clubs 2016. That's a nice little readout of what, when you should expect the book club, not when the book book club should be when you should expect. Yes, like this quarter when you got all your book clubs in one week. Yes. (laughs) That's about it. Thank you for listening to our wonderful book club. I have been Krista, your host, and with me is Oren and Aaron. Find us on Podcast Evolved on Facebook, uh, Twitter, Twitch, all that great stuff. Instagram. Just look up Podcast Evolved. You'll find us somewhere. Um, My personal gamer tag is capital K-O-N-A-N, capital X, capital D. Aaron? And my gamer tag is Perpetual Big A-C. Oren? And my gamer tag is Tetrahedrite. All right. Well, thank you very much for listening. Evolved. Evolved. Evolved.